Hi guys, welcome along to uh, the second episode of my big interview series. Delighted to say that I'm in front of, well, rugby royalty in itself, maybe. He might not consider himself it, uh, but former England hooker, uh, George Shooter. George, delighted to have you here. How are you coping Hello, at this moment in time? Uh, yeah, getting a bit stir crazy like uh, most other people, I guess. But um, yeah, it's, it is what it is. You've got to deal with it. I mean, we've, we've got to do got to do what the government's telling us to do and hopefully if we keep our heads down and, and stay stay safe we can we can get through this uh, as quickly as possible but yeah it's, it's a little bit frustrating a little bit boring i have to say um but yeah uh, dealing with it i suppose yeah i can imagine um if you don't mind just quickly talking about what you're doing now you're director of rugby at hinkley rugby club at the moment um no no i left that uh, left at the end of last year actually. oh so, oh so you left at the end of last year okay sorry um i was yeah. i read up on your wikipedia page that you were still there so you were there for a you were there for a period of time how did you find that uh, two years yeah two years I, I, it, was, it was good um i think i, mean, I live i live about five minutes down the road um and i, I previously i was coaching at Loughborough university and this opportunity came up at hinkley and um it, it, was, it was a chance to sort of try myself for uh, something different rather than just coaching and trying to add a bit more uh, admin and a bit more dealing with other bits of the rugby club than just the players um, and again it was on the doorstep so I, I thought it sort of took the opportunity a friend of mine uh, was doing it before me and, and he said do you fancy a go so I, I, I gave it a crack and we had a couple of really good years there good fun um, finished I think we finished fifth and then sort of ninth or something national two north um, but at the same time think other things I, mean, I do quite a lot of corporate hospitality and I work for an events company as well uh, and that started to take off, and uh, the, they were asking me to do more sort of things in London on a Thursday night, for example. Uh, and I was having to turn that down because of the the coaching commitment. So, so I got to the sort of halfway, just over halfway through the second season at Hinkley, and I just had to have a bit of a, a an assessment of where I was going and what I was doing and what was best for me and best for my family. And uh, and that actually involved stepping away from rugby for a bit and getting my weekends back and also committing to. Uh, a, a bit more work in, in, in sort of events hospitality. So um, I had a great time. I think a fantastic club, really good local community club, some really good people, uh, both employees and, and volunteers are involved in the club. And it's a, it's a great setup. Actually, they're doing, they've done, well, they were doing very well this season without me. So uh, they're clearly not missing me too much. Um, but yeah, it, it was it was very interesting. As I say, very different to, uh, to the Loughborough job I was doing where I was very much uh, just an assistant coach and doing a lot of coaching, working with a lot of different players and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, the director of rugby group was more um, across the board, across the whole club, and included to deal with, deal with sort of the sponsors and uh, the members and all that sort of stuff and payroll and a bit of the, the sort of you know, non-glamorous stuff that you have to do with it, uh, deal with it at that sort of semi-pro level. Absolutely, yeah. It's, it's, it's a very difficult... Uh box of eggs I suppose compared to the premiership level you've got a lot of at premiership level you've got a lot of players who know that the financial security is there whereas the national one national two players are very much searching for additional financial security through their yeah. semi-professional rugby yeah absolutely yeah and that was a bit of a, a bit of a sort of um, eye-opener for me I mean fortunately I, so my three years at Loughborough I sort of gave me a bit of an insight as to what it's like in the national leagues Loughborough were playing in national one at the time and they were getting no money the students they, they, there, was a, there were a few of them on bursaries but um very, very little money flying around there, but other than sort of some, some uh, fairly tight fisting expenses. Um, but then moving to Hinkley, where, where all the guys were full time employed elsewhere, um, in various careers, sort of you know, from, varying from manual labour up to people who are working in sort of management for, for security firms or things like that. Um, so, yeah, that actually the rugby firm was, like I said, a bit more of a top up of, uh, uh, of their finances and not necessarily something they spend seven days a week thinking about, which I sort of found a bit frustrating, I have to say, um, because we were, we were covering stuff in training and then guys would go home and they'd go back to their families, go to their job and then come back to the next training session. They'd have sort of almost forgotten uh, forgotten about what we spoke yeah. about. Yeah, and, and then trying to trying to sort of improve week after week is very difficult when you, you haven't got that sort of time to put in, looking at video and working on your individual stuff, which obviously you get plenty of time to do that in the professional game. So, yeah, very, very different, very different. Um, uh, but actually, great fun. Uh, we got to, I mean, I we got to go to play at some of the old great old clubs at like Preston Grasshoppers and um, yeah, those sort of teams up in the north that, that were, were, were massive clubs when I was starting playing rugby. They were they were sort of top clubs in England in sort of the top division when the when the league sort of started. Um, so that was great going back to see some of the grassroots like rugby from from history as it were. And it's a good standard. National League rugby is a good standard. There's some good young players coming up through the ranks, and there's some 
wily old players who've been around or higher up and on their way down and uh, and looking to sort of move on to the next stage of their lives. So it was it was great great experience. But like I say it just got to a stage where I had to sort of make a choice really to to sort of balance up what I was doing. Absolutely. And um, one player that comes to mind for me in particular, having watched a lot of National League rugby over the years, who actually ended up making his way to South End at one point was Chris Chesney. And you've and you, and you probably know who he is and uh, uh, what he was a, well. what what he was about as a player. And uh, let's just say it was interesting to see him on a National League pitch uh, with a lot more fans up close, seeing what he was up to on a rugby pitch, yeah. <laughs> um, especially when he could be, especially when he didn't want to do the running as well. Um, yeah. So if you don't mind, just going back to your early days at Saracens in particular, um, if you don't mind talking me through kind of the process of how you came to being at Saracens and kind of what the academy experience was like for you. Uh, well, that, 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 that's where I always start. There, there was no academy. So this is 1994, 95. I was playing for London Under-21s in the sort of the uh, divisional championship used to have back then. Um, and the coach was a guy called Mark Evans, who was happened to be head coach at Saracens. This is still the amateur era. So yeah. the game went professional Christmas 95. Uh, Mark Evans was in charge around that sort of time. That's when they signed uh, Michael Liner, uh, Philippe Seller to join Saracens. They became the first sort of big spending uh, English club. And then at the end of that season, uh, Mark, the end of the sort of county, sort of the uh, cha- uh, divisional championship, which was about sort of March time, uh, Mark said to me, look, do you, do you fancy going for a run around at Saracens? And I didn't really think about it too much, to be honest. I, I just enjoyed playing for my schools, the old boys in South London, uh, where I grew up. Uh, didn't know where Saracens was. I very rarely went to North London, um, certainly not uh, without a bit of, bit of company. Um, and then he, he said, do you want to come, just come run around in training in June, in your sort of pre-season? So I said, yeah, yeah, I, I fancy a bit of that. Um, so I turned up on, on Brownie Road, uh, just off Cockfrost's Road, on the old recreation grounds. Um, tiny sort of uh, clubhouse and stand and walked into the changing rooms on a Tuesday night, I think it was in yeah June, uh, mid-June. Started getting changed next to Michael Liner and, and Philippe Sello was on the other side. I was like, this is a bit surreal. I'm not too sure what's, what's going on here. And, and then sort of trained with them for two weeks over the summer, Tuesday, Thursday nights, travelled up there on the train. Uh, and then after that, Mark uh, said to me, oh, do you want to sign a full-time contract? And that was it. I was like, yeah, well, why not? And, um, I'll be playing rugby for a hobby, and you may as well, you know, you're going to give me some money for it. Brilliant. Fine. Yeah. And that was that was how I was scouted and brought through, brought through the system. It was just very much a case. And that was how it was done back then, especially in, in London, where you've got a lot of rugby clubs. Um, not not so much at, 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 um, in North London, sorry enough, but certainly in sort of South West London with Richmond, Roslyn Park, uh, Wasp were more around that sort of time in, in, in um sort of north northwest London. Uh, but that was it, you know, you went to school in that area and people said, Oh geez, Quinn's Quinn's contacted me when I was about seventeen, asking me if I'd go in their sort of youth team and I just it was a bit too much of a trek to, to sort of commit to it. So I just carried on playing for my old boys team in in, uh, in South London. And we were, but at that time we were playing uh, just below National League, so the league below National League. So it was you know level six I think it was at the time. So pretty pretty decent level. Uh, but yeah, and then people get people hear you are oh, get your reputation, and they say, "Oh, do you fancy going for a run around with us?" And eventually, you get signed. That was how it was. There was no there was no pathway. There was no like academy system as such. You had youth teams, but invariably the youth teams were, were just like an extension of any other club in the in the area. The local lads go there with their dads to play and end up playing in the youth team. It was, yeah, that sort of um, hit and miss really. A lot of word of mouth stuff, I'd imagine back then. Yeah, and yeah, um, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So that it really comes to a point actually where you it's very different times now you've got players who are in these academy sides from uh, even under 13s under 14s uh elite yeah, player elite development elite. group setups um yeah. who have very much set their sights on a rugby career and imagine at 13 14 you were just messing about with your mates and didn't really think about rugby as a career Absolutely, or anything yeah. else I was still doing that at twenty, actually. <laughs> um, oh, I, 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 say, I grew up. I grew up in South London, so there wasn't a huge amount of rugby in in my area uh, in Croydon. Um, I played a lot of cricket. My dad was a good cricketer um, when he was younger, so I played cricket all the year. Didn't really like football. Never really got into football. Um, so then I went to went to a private school when I was twelve, and um, they played rugby. So it was a case of Wednesday afternoon, first Wednesday of school. Uh, everyone's going out to play rugby. You had to buy a rugby kit and. I'd, you know, I'd seen a bit on TV. My dad was a bit of a rugby fan, but not again back in the mid to late eighties. There, there was very little rugby on TV even, so um, very little exposure to it. And 
started playing it and sort of I could catch and throw through the cricket. So it was very, yeah, you're, you're all right, you can come over here. The rest of you guys who can't do anything, go stand over there, you know, you'll go and do something else. And that was it, started playing rugby. And then it's a case of you're, you're fat and small, you can go in the front row. Um, second row, you're tall, you can, and that was it. And that was yeah. genuinely how it was. It was, it was just, just sort of fell into it. Back in the old, back in the old roots, definitely. Um, yeah. So when you first joined Saracens, you say you trained for two weeks over a summer and then were eventually offered a full-time contract. Um, yeah. What was, I suppose you didn't think of it as this is going to be really long-term. You thought this will be nice while it, while it lasts. Yeah, well, I mean, there was, there was so much uncertainty at that time. So the game went globally professional on Christmas 95. So 96 was the first full-time professional league. Um, and the RFU actually at the time didn't want anything to do with rugby. They didn't, they didn't want to essentially contract the players or anything. They were... They were convinced that the, the game would, it would fall, it would fail, there wouldn't be enough money. Uh, and in two or three years' time, they'll just get the players back and it would be it would carry on being an amateur game. So I don't think anyone really knew what to expect. And actually, for the first two years of professional rugby, it was, it was the same. We had uh, Mark Evans, for example, he was still uh, teaching. He was still, I think he was a head teacher, or he was certainly teaching at a school in Essex. Um, and he, so he did that. We trained on a Tuesday and Thursday night with the uh, part timers who were still working full time elsewhere. And the rest of the time, they were about I don't know, 15, 16, 18 of us full-time players, uh, we'd train sort of Monday to Friday, literally 9 till 4, nine till four and we'd be on the training field for three hours in the morning, three hours in the afternoon. So the game was, people didn't know how to do it. People didn't know how to be professional. They just sort of said, right, you signed a professional contract, you're here at the club from this time to that time, as you would if you were in office. Yeah. So there's no sort of rest days, really. No, no sort of... No understanding of physiology, etc. Absolutely none at all. None at all. And again, the... the um, our fitness guy, our S&C guy, you call him now, uh, he was um, this guy called Matthew Yates who used to run 1,500 metres for Great Britain. His dad, Mike Yates, was, um, he lived around the corner and he used to come down and do fitness. So you know, he, he had no idea, had no expertise, in, in particularly in um, sort of rehab and all that sort of stuff and took weights. But he just sort of tra- helped train his son. So he did the same sort of stuff with us. And it was great at the time because you've got to bear in mind, back in the amateur days, people did very little, majority of players did very little fitness at all. So this guy comes in and suddenly we're actually we're running around a lot. We're doing particular running endurance drills and sprint drills and this sort of stuff. But again, you compare it to what we've got today with state-of-the-art gyms and five or six um, players per uh, fitness coach. It was, it was light years away from that, absolutely light years away. Uh, but then, as I say, and that was the same for every club, really. People just didn't know how to be a professional rugby player, how to be a professional coach. It just wasn't, it wasn't natural to, to most people. Exactly. Um, so you go from what you say was the sixth division in English rugby to then the top division with Saracens, which is quite a step up, actually. You see, you see the occasional hidden gems. Uh, I can think to a couple that um, I've seen local sides pick up where they've come from about the eighth or ninth tier and really f- fit in at National 1 or National 2 level. And it's it, it's yeah. one of those things that you occasionally get right. And uh, yeah. I suppose for you, was it a case of just work hard every day and then hopefully it will keep on progressing. Did you still see something else as a long-term career? or? I don't know. I don't, I don't know when I really sort of saw it as a long-term career. Again, it was all a bit of a novelty. It's on offering you money to play. And again, I've been offered um, money by clubs for, for a couple of years, since, certainly since sort of uh, the old brown envelopes, that sort of stuff. So the money was um, not unusual in rugby. Uh, and when it went professional in 95, there were straight away there were lots of people, uh, particularly my sort of age group, we got 18, 19-year-olds who were being approached by clubs like that. Richmond Island, Twitter, Russell Park, all these sort of guys. So it wasn't a case of being completely naive about money, but no one knew how the game was going to go. Um, yeah, so I think, funny enough, the jump wasn't so big then as it would be now because at the time, even sort of the mid to late 80s, early 90s, the Premier, the top top division, first division, whatever they call it, actually wasn't a huge uh, gap between that and everything else because the players at the top there were still part time. They all worked in banks and schools and accountants and whatever. So the, the difference was obviously they were a little bit better players. They were probably a little bit more committed and did a bit more training that sort of thing. So compared to now, to even even level four or five, um, compared to the Premiership now, it's it's it's, a, it's light years away. So that that was a it was a bit of an easier bridge to gap there, bridge to cross then I suppose than than it is now. But, but yeah, still I just I went up there and. Um, just got stuck in. I, I, I enjoyed the training. I enjoyed, always enjoyed training. Actually, uh, obviously loved playing. And fortunately, that year, uh, 96, 97 season, we played loads of rugby because we had a. Um, we signed Saracen signed about 15 or 
16 new players, a lot of internationals, obviously, but also some local players and some uh, English players who were on the way up. Uh, so that meant basically they, they could run a second team, which was the previous year's first team, uh, almost intact. So we had a very, very good second team. I played with some very, very good players who were just coming towards the end of their career. Guys like uh, John Buckton, who got a couple of caps for, for England in the late 80s. Um, a couple of really grisly props around me, like Stuart Wilson and Richie Andrews, uh, who sort of really made my um, entry into sort of proper adult senior rugby uh, a bit smoother than it could have been. So I had a great, had a great year. I played, played a bit of well, got involved in the first team a bit, played a bit of midweek uh, Anglo-Welsh games for the first team. But the majority of my rugby in that, in that first season was was played at uh, second team level. And we played every other club uh, twice, home and away. So we, we played about 24, 25 games uh, and good quality games as well. They, they were not far off first team level. So it's a really good introduction to me to, to senior at our rugby. Um, and, it, and, I, and I loved it. I, I, got, I, I got there, I got to the training, loved the training, loved the playing, got a really good bunch of people around me, had some really good mates there. Uh, I was pretty young. I mean, what I did, 20. Uh, and in the squad, squad of 30, 35, there were probably only about three people who were my sort of age. The rest were sort of mid to late 20s onwards because, again, the, the game was very different back then. Uh, it, not many youngsters got uh, got a go in early. So it was, it was very much a sort of a, an experienced player's game rather than the youngsters. So, um, you know, it, again, it was all sort of a bit of a, a bit of a lifestyle change for me as well, a bit of a culture shock, moving out of house, moving out, moving out home and... Uh, moving to North London and, and, and basically playing at that sort of level. So, yeah, it was great. And, and so I, I really enjoyed it. And I think I sort of I took it pretty quickly. And, um, you yeah, know, I guess uh, well, the rest of the history, I guess. Absolutely. Um, after Saracens, you went off to Australia, is it, I believe, for kind of a, a gap year kind of thing. Uh, did you play any play any rugby out there? No, you'd call it sabbatical now. So uh, I, I came, um, I got to the end of uh, season 99-2000. So it's about... May, April, May 2000. And I'd, I'd been offered another contract, but I'd come to the end of the contract, been offered another contract by Saracens. And I, I was just, I was a little bit, again, you'd call it burnt out these days. I was just a bit bored in rugby. I'd been, I played 92 games in just, over, just about three years for, for the Saracens first team. Um, and I went on tour in England in 98. So I had about two weeks off between seasons, the three seasons. And I just, I just had enough of rugby. I was, I was, I was not, not necessarily knackered, but just mentally, just burnt out, frazzled, not enjoying training, not enjoying playing. And I thought, I can't just sign this contract and carry on willy nilly because let yourself. Down. You won't, you won't be able to perform to the level that you want to perform yeah, to yeah, as well. It's yeah, difficult. So I, I had, a, had a good chat with Francois Pina at the time, who was, who was head coach, uh, and I, I explained it to him. So I'm, I'm just not in, my head's not in this at all. I need, I need to step back. Um, yeah, looking back, it was, it was a massive decision. <laughs> it could have gone very wrong for me. Well, I could have just disappeared. But at the time, I just I felt it was the right thing to do. Um, and so, yeah, this, this contract ran out. And I, I spent a couple of months sort of in the summer catching up with mates from school around the, around the country. Um, then I went out to Australia for a month. And this was it was reported at the time I was retiring and going to emigrate. Like that it was never quite the, uh, the idea. But I, I, did, I didn't know if I was going to come back and play rugby again. I went to Australia in September for the Olympics in 2000. Uh, I was in Sydney for four weeks, which was amazing. Got to see uh, quite a bit of the Olympics as well. Uh, and then my wife, my girlfriend back then, she's now my wife, um, she was teaching in North Carolina for a year as, as part of a sort of faculty exchange. Uh, and I went and stayed with her for a month as well. So I was bummed around in America for a bit, bummed around in Australia for a bit, came back home, uh, back to my parents' house, which was a bit of a shock. Um, and at that time was would have been sort of late November, uh, 2000. And a mate of mine who who had been my agent previously, he'd sort of been putting my name around behind my back as such. I, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. He's back in the um, country. Yeah, get, 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 yeah. get, get yeah. onto him. I, 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 I mean, I had a lot of time to think and sort of evaluate and rest. Didn't didn't touch a road ball. Didn't really watch any rugby in this time. Um, just sort of ate and drank my lights. So I basically I left the game completely. And then I came back to England and um, I had some sort of personal issues that needed sorting out that meant I couldn't go and emigrate even if I really wanted to. Uh, and this guy had spoken to a couple of clubs and one of them was Leicester. So I came up and um, had, a, had a meeting with my hero, Dean Richards. Um, and that, that meeting was very, very short. He said, we want you. I said, where do I sign? Um, and, and that was it. I, I, I joined them in December 2000. Yeah, December 2000. And I moved up to Leicester just after New Year, you know, 2001. So, um, yeah, and then, uh, again, the rest of that history, another 14 years later and, and I retired. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I've, so, from my understanding, as soon as you went in Leicester, obviously as a hooker, 
um, you were battling alongside who would a man who would go on to become oh, Leicester Tigers good. head coach a few good years job, later. Yeah. Loads, of, loads of different really good players at the time. Um, how was what was the competition like between you and those players? <laughs> I mean, it was interesting. And the you know, one of the reasons I wanted to go there is because I didn't think if I got back to Saracens, I think I would just would have slipped back into the old routine. Not not saying by any means I would have been straight been picked straight away, but I thought a, a change would be as good as the rest. So I thought we'd leave leave Saracens. And at that time, they'd already uh, got a full squad. They had no room for me in sort of Christmas 2000. I did speak to Francois Pino when I came back. Um, so I went up to Leicester. And I thought this, this is it. This, this, this is a challenge here. Two England hookers in, in the club. Um, it's got a really good new system that people are coming through. I played against Leicester, I don't know, about nine or ten times for Saracens. So I knew I knew the ground, I knew the people, I knew the fans, I knew what, a, what an intimidating place it was. Um, I knew a lot of the guys as well, a lot of players from being involved in England in sort of 98, uh, 97, 98. So I've met Martin Johnson and the ABC club and Martin Corey and these sort of guys, Neil Black. Um, so, and, and actually, they made me feel pretty welcome. But I mean, the good thing for me was because I'd done nothing literally nothing for six months. Uh, they basically sent me away on like the, the backfield with the S&C guy for about a month. And I, all I did was, was running and fitness with him and weights with him, basically getting myself into some sort of shape before I could join, join in training properly. Um, so yeah, that, that took about three or, three or four weeks there. And then I started getting involved with training and I played in the second team and um, being, started being involved with the, with the first team. And um, yeah, the, the competition was... I mean, three three of us were very different characters. Obviously, Cockers was very sort of uh, very in your face and loud and uh, ranty, shouty. Uh, Westy was a bit more sort of jovial, cheerful. You know, you know, still pretty tough and uncompromising, but far sort of far more laid back about it. And I think I was probably somewhere in between. And st- certainly, while I was finding my feet, I was probably the, the quietest of the three, just getting my head down and uh, learning the calls, learning learning the, learning the patterns, learning the way we train because the training was. Very, very different to, to what I'd experienced at Saracens. Um, so that, but that, that sort of competition drove me on because I knew that uh, if I wanted to play, I've got to go and try and play better than these two international hookers here. Um, and then, and, and again, similar to the way uh, I sort of got to Saracens and, and felt at home, I, I, was, I felt at home straight away at Leicester. Um, I never thought I would. I used to hate them when I played for Saracens. They were, our, they were our biggest rivals apart from perhaps the London clubs. Um, and some of their players were the, the, sort of the guys we, we had real proper ding dongs with. So, I'd, you know, if you'd asked me in 1998 if you want to play for Leicester, I'd have laughed you in the, laughed in your face and uh, said no. Um, but yeah, it, it was good. And the training was tough, and um, there, was, there was no sort of no sort of court given or asked. But again, I, I, I adapt to that. I felt really at home there. I, I love living up there. I'm still up here now. I, I, I do love the city. I love I love the whole sort of area around. So it was it was a really I mean. Again, looking back, it was it was a great decision. I don't know how I made it, I don't know why I made it. I guess it's just because I'm a big fan of Dean Richards, but um, it just it just worked, and I, I sort of felt I felt right at home straight away. Absolutely. So you went on to win at Leicester at least two premierships, at least one European. Is it two premierships. Six premierships. Oh, six premierships. Sorry, do apologise for two that. European cups. Two um, European, so six. You you reel them off, mate. You go for it. Six premierships. I, I think six premierships. Uh, two European cups, two uh, Anglo Welsh cup, whatever you call it, the uh, EDF cup and LV cup, that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah so, so yeah, good, yeah, yeah. Ten, ten, ten tribes. Yeah. You'd argue at the time you were part of a revolution that was much to the sort of Manchester United in football as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, again. Well, what I was saying earlier about the, the early years of professionalism, the, the biggest change at Leicester was they hired Bob Dyer in about um, 1998, 97, I think it was, 97, 98. And you know, Bob, Bob had been working, obviously been coaching in Australia, coached Australia to the World Cup in 91. Uh, he'd been coaching in Italy, and actually there was a, there was a bit of a semi-professional league in Italy in, in sort of the sort of grey area around 95 when the game was going professional. Uh, so he came to Leicester and actually changed the way they did things. He, he dragged them into the professional era. Um, and actually, he, he 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 was not everyone's cup of tea. He was not a it was a polarizing character up here. He still is. He still find plenty of people that don't like him, and plenty of people that do. Um, but one thing he did was was drag Leicester into the professional era, and that's why between ninety eight and two thousand two, Leicester were ahead of the curve and won four consecutive premierships because they were just that bit more professional. They, they had a great squad, obviously. They had some sort of once in a generation players, but. Those players are also happened to be very naturally professional. They they they, they train like professionals when they were 
um, working, but um, and, and all their all their sort of their training was geared toward being better players. So that sort of uh, gave Leicester a very head start in the professional era. Um, and you know, just I think that's 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 where that sort of dominance came from, and that's all. Obviously, the history of the club was great as well, and the, the history was was what made the club where it is. Obviously, and it's been carried on for what carried on as much now but uh, that was certainly a big driving force but uh, yeah it, it, it was just at that time you know, Leicester were just a, uh, ahead of everyone else in terms of preparation and and, and probably the way they played as well so um a person a question, <laughs> say, say that again sorry I don't know if that answered the question. Oh no, it, it, it did, mate. It's absolutely fine. Uh, oh, I've got I've got those cups similar. Got those glasses similar to myself. They're the posh glasses. Well, no, I just mixed it with my pub somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, really, one of the play, one of the people that I've come across, uh, mainly from my association with Cambridge Rugby Club, uh, mainly was uh, Craig Newby, who you played, who you played with for a few yeah. years, I believe, and he was also. Uh, yeah, I've been. Uh... It's only three, three or four years before he retired. Yeah, three years at least. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, if you don't mind me asking, when when I when I came across him, he always he always he always um, came across to me as a bit of a silent assassin. Would yeah. would would listen in, would listen intently for about what was going on. Would form his own opinion, and then when he needed to, he'd rattle a few cages as well. Was that was that what <laughs> you was that what you came across as well? Yeah, pretty much. Um, he's just a hell of a player. Um, Perhaps a little bit unlucky. He just towards the end of his career had quite a lot of knee issues. Um, in fact, one year we, we, we played in the Premiership final. In fact, he, played, he was man of the match in the Premiership semi final, and he'd not been able to train properly for about two months. He'd been on like a stationary bike, and that was all the fitness he could do. He just uh, he, he, his knee was that bad, and he ended up being sort of the, the, the semi final man of the match. I think we. He might have lost that final to Wasps, I think. But anyway, he, he, he was a hell of a player. And yeah, you're right. He was quiet. He, he was. Um, I mean, what you see is what you get with noobs. I think really. he's he just uh, he stuck to what he, he knew. He's, he's a very experienced player. He played a lot of rugby for the Highlanders in, in the Super Super Rugby and uh, New Zealand Sevens as well. A Commonwealth gold medal for New Zealand Sevens, which is not bad because he's uh, playing the same position as a certain Richie McCaw. Um, you know, if McCaw had not been around, noobs probably would have won forty or fifty caps. But um, yeah, uh, yeah, and he, he, he knows the game. He's actually doing a cracking job now. He's coaching. Uh, well, he works at St John's in Leatherhead. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, rugby. Uh, but he's he's got a pretty impressive coaching uh, CV already. He's been working with Wasps Academy, Cambridge, as I said. Uh, he's been doing a bit with um, Wasps again, I believe. Uh, he went out uh, to Japan as well for a year, didn't he? Uh, to Japan, NEC yeah. Green Rockets uh, and stuff. He's working with England, England, sort of, uh, England girls under, under 20 and under 18 as well. So yeah. he, he knows the game. And um, I think, I think uh, when, you, when, you, when you've when you played as much as he has and you played in, in as many sort of Parts of the world, you've got that experience. You, you sort of rely on your own experience. So you're not you're not being arrogant or rude. But if someone's telling you to do something, you categorically know through experience that that's not right. Then why would you do what you're not supposed to be doing? Um, yeah, you, that's that's what experience is about. It's knowing that, and, and it's it's also doing it the right ways without being rude or without being disrespectful to the coach or whoever's telling you what to do. Just sort of yeah, get, get on with what you know how to do, and that's new to Loma. He's he's you know he's um. I, I, I did a bit of coaching with him over over sort of the uh, um, end of last year with with the England England ladies, England girls, um, and his his style is he's good. He's 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 a, he's a good coach. I mean, he gets his points across well. He's obviously got a wealth of knowledge technically, but it's actually his presentation that I think is really good. He's he's a, he's a good listener. He's a good talker. He's a good communicator. Yeah. Keep up communicating, which is which is a big thing about coaching. No, absolutely, I remember having him for. A... Uh, I played a lot of youth rugby locally, so I'm having him for a couple of pre-season sessions as well. And he yeah. he introduced us first to when we were first able to start kind of lifting in the lineouts, and uh, yeah. yeah, he was very good, very technically about that, very technically about yeah. Yeah. building the wall and bringing it in and making sure you're strong yeah. and stable yeah. as a pillar and stuff like that. It was really good in terms of getting yeah. the three men to work as a unit and communicate with each other yeah. and so forth. Um, now, um, England was a big part of your career as well. Uh, you talk about going on tour with England in 1998 um, yeah. and things like that. Um, how much, I suppose, pride did you have yourself in representing your country? Uh, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's very difficult to put it into words. I mean, um, I, I, whilst I didn't grow up being a, road, being a road player until I was 12 or 13 years old, very quickly I wanted to play for England because 
back then you could be a teacher or an accountant or lawyer or whatever and also play for England. You could, you could do that. It was, it was amateur. So I wanted to do that. I wanted to, wanted to, actually, I wanted to be a teacher back when I probably was about 14, 15, go from GCSEs. That's what I always had in mind. Um, and, and that was always the goal. It was always the goal to play for England. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know... I don't know when I first started taking rugby really seriously and thinking I could do this. Um, perhaps, perhaps not, well, not not that young at all. Sometimes with that insecurity that runs sort of through you, am I good enough? Am I good enough? That that can drive you on a bit. So, uh, but that that was always the goal for me. I always wanted to play for England and I wanted to be Brian Ball. He was my my sort of hooking idol at the time. Outside, sorry, apart from Sean Fitzpatrick. Um, but yeah, I, and that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to go and play at Twickenham. I wanted to play against the, the Scots and the Welsh. I wanted to play in the Five Nations. That was the, the premier tournament in the, in, in the world. Apart from the World Cup now, it probably still is. The Six Nations is, Absolutely. is, is the envy of the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and then to sort of finally get there and do that and pull a shirt on and play at Twickenham. Um, I've got my, my, my favourite picture. I can't remember what it is now. My favourite picture is... Um, we, we beat Scotland at uh, Twickenham and I'm sat in the changing and holding the Calcutta Cup. I remember watching on TV and BBC back in the day, Bill McLaren commentating you know, England losing the, the, the Grand Slam to Scotland in 1990. Sort of like, this, this Calcutta Cup was there. So I'm sort of yeah. sat on this bench at Twickenham. You, re- you reversed the t- you reversed history. Yeah, yeah, it, it was just incredible. And uh, like I say, it's, it's difficult to put into words the sort of pride you feel. And not just your first game, but any game where you, where you run out and you're, you're playing for England, and whether it's one of those sort of weekday games on a tour or a World Cup game where you sing the anthem, regardless, it's just, it's just gave me a huge, huge uh, feeling of pride. And um, it's, I mean, I, I, I don't know about the sort of highlights of my career, the best moments, whatever, I don't know. It's very difficult to sort of categorise the ball, but that certainly, well, running out for England on any occasion would be, would be up there with, with, with sort of the best memories I've got. Absolutely. You came away with a 2007 runners-up medal, came off the bench in 2007 for, yeah. I want to say it was for Steve Thompson, was it? No, no, no Mark Regan. Oh, Mark Regan, okay. Yeah, I'm probably a few years out with that one then. No, yeah, no not so... Well, no, not, 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 pardon? Tom was 2003. Oh, Tom was 2003, exactly. Yeah, yeah, no, you're absolutely right there. Um, so would you have played, so I don't, would you have played in the, did you cut yourself off from international rugby after the 2007 World Cup or were you still involved? No, no, no. I, I, I carried on playing. Um, I, I was involved uh, up until 2010. My last, my last game with England was uh, we played, we beat Australia in Sydney actually in, in July 2010. Yeah, I came off the bench there for uh, I don't know, about 15 minutes or so and, and we won that game which was until, pre, until recently, it was the last time we won in Sydney, the first time we've beaten Australia in Australia since 2003. So uh, that was quite a big, big, uh, big game. And, and I, um, I was in the, the sort of the, the preliminary squad for the World Cup in 2011. Uh, fell at the last hurdle there, got uh, got bin just before they named, named the final squad, and, and never played for England again. So yeah, I, I had four years, four years in and around the international rugby, and yeah, I loved uh, 50 or 60 more caps, but. Um, I, I, I think um, certainly when I look at my career and, and, and sort of probably more to the point my sort of physical abilities and who I am, I, I'm very happy with uh, getting any sort of recognition at that level. I think I overachieved in my career in general and I never have uh, never put myself anywhere near the top sort of 10 hookers in the world at any point in my career. So to win 24 caps and play in a World Cup final and get to see some uh, amazing places and play against some of the greats of the game, that's... Um, uh, as a career, I can't can't argue that too much, or um, as much as I'd like to under caps. Absolutely. Um, so you talk about the 2011 squad um, on the on the cusp of it, and eventually told, look, George, we've got other options this time. I'm afraid you won't be travelling to New Zealand. Uh, I believe it was New Zealand, wasn't it, in 2011? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and Jono Mark Johnson was the coach at the head coach at the time oh, as yeah. well. So yeah. imagine a friend as well, still to this day. Um, how difficult was that conversation between two play- two people that have played together as well? Yeah, I didn't I did speak to John about it. Um, so we we, um, we we came back from the last um, last day of the camp was on a Friday or something in just I think it'd been August, sometime like that, um, late late July, early August. Uh, so we came back on a Friday night, and then they were announcing the squad. Uh, I think midday, uh, the final squad of midday on Saturday. And I, I live in the same village as Graham Roundtree, and Graham Roundtree was the coach as well. He was the Ford's coach. Yeah. yeah. Was the coach. Um, and I, I had a few drinks on the Friday night. I got home and hadn't seen the missus for a while, so we, we went out and had a bite to eat, had a few drinks. Uh, got woken up about 8 a.m. in the morning by a phone call from, from Wig, from Graham Roundtree. I'm like, 
I still sort of stood in the salon for years. He's, not, he's never phoned me in his life, let alone at 8 yeah. in the morning on a Saturday. So I picked the phone up, I was like, Graham, hello. And he's like, um, yeah, mate. Um, and in fact, no, he didn't. He, he came round to my house. He knocked on my door at 8 in the morning. Um, again, because he lives about half a mile away. And he came to the door, and I was like, oh, who the hell's that at 8 o'clock on a Saturday? And it's, it's, it's weird. And he's like, mate, can I come in uh, for a cup of tea? I'm like, yeah. Um, obviously, I knew, I knew what he was here for. Um, and he, he, he sort of we sat down in my living room, and he, uh, he said, look, you know, we're, we're, we're going with the three guys we've got. We're, we're not taking you down to the World Cup. Um, but that's it. You're probably your international career is over. Um, and, you know, I, I'd say, once, once I saw him at the door, I, I knew what to expect. Um, but, no, yeah, a, a huge amount of respect for him to saying it to me face-to-face. He could quite easily have got John O to phone me or, you know, Clive Woodward used to just stick it on CFAX or an email. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, the fact that he, he was a, he's a good enough mate to come around here and sort of break it break it to me face to face was was great and I was yeah, mate, fine there. That's I can't completely understand the decision. I don't agree with it. Obviously, I think I can still do it, but you guys put the squad. Um, good luck. Uh, I, I think I was on standby as well. So if there'd been injuries, I, I'd have probably been thrown out. But as it happened, uh, Steve Thompson, Dylan, and uh, Lee Mears uh, were the three guys who went out there, and and, and I, I that was it. I, my international career was over. But yeah. It, it, Again, part of the hardest thing in coaching I've found is, and I'm not actually happy to do this to be honest, but being coached by your mates is tough. So I can imagine being a coach and having people like me uh, and uh, Dan Cole was, was also pretty good mates with Graham Roundtree at the time. Um, not so much with John O, but actually coaching your mates and, and, and sort of being being the boss, as it were, is, is the toughest part about coaching in some respects. Because you've got to you've got to forget that relationship. You're not mates anymore. You're, you, you're, you're in John O's case, he was, he was a gaffer. Uh, so making those hard decisions about people you know and that have known for a long time can be tough. But part of it also is, is being um, big enough on both sides, big enough to take criticism and give it and, and not let that sort of uh, personal relationship get in the way of the professional relationship. Absolutely. So it was a very difficult um, thing to have happened, obviously, in 2011. Did it um, allow you to refocus, I guess, on your club career at the time? Yeah, I mean, I was, uh, what, 35 35 that summer, so you know, it was sort of natural. I, I, again, I've I'd not had any um, sort of goals in, in the international rugby. I got picked, and I would never, well, although I wanted to play, I wasn't expecting it and played for probably a bit longer than I should have done. Um, there, there are other good players out there. Um, so you know, I, I'd, I'd, no, I'd no qualms about being a 35 year old ex international. Um, but yeah, we, 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 had, we had a pretty good squad at Leicester at the time, so I went back in. Again, this was a halfway through pre-season that year. Um, I was in pretty good shape because we have been training hard with England, so hit the ground running at Leicester. Uh, ended up playing, I think, 65-odd um, games in the next two seasons for them, including all the finals we got to. So, yeah, it, it, it was almost not, not a relief because you want to play for them, you want to be involved, but actually it's hard work. It's hard work training with England. It's hard work going back and forward through down the motorway to, to the training camps and being away from your family for X amount of time. Obviously, the games... Games are quite tough and physical as well. Um, so actually, it was nice after, well, effectively, I think I got back involved with England A in sort of 2004. Um, so for six years, I've been back and forward between there, away over the summer. And it was nice to actually say, okay, I'm, I'm back now, I'm back at the club, I don't have to worry about any other sets of calls or any other any other bits of kit or whatever. Uh, I can just sort of knuckle down and, and do the day job, um, which, 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 which I did. And I'd say we had, a, we had a bit of a purple patch going at the time at Leicester. And, um, yeah, it was, it was a job. It was very easy to sort of forget about the disappointment of being, not being the World Cup when you've got Cockles barking at living training uh, every day. Absolutely, of course. Richard Cockrell, who you played with, now was your head coach and was the man who was selecting you pretty much every week for every opportunity as well. Um, I can imagine that itself was quite a... Um, at sometimes easy relationship to maintain, at sometimes difficult relationship to maintain. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, you're right, Deborah. Right. Both of us. I think away from rugby, we, we get on really well, me and Cockers, and, and actually our families get on well as well. Um, I, I think when it when it comes to actually rugby itself, we're, we're on the same sort of page. But again, as I said earlier, we're different characters. So yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a, certainly a bit more laid back than he is, um, and I think sometimes that would frustrate him as a coach. Um, I didn't do it deliberately. I didn't do it to antagonise him or anything like that. And I'd no certainly had no bad blood from when we played against each other. We had some again put some good good battles against each other as individuals and as uh, as clubs in terms of Leicester Saracens. Um, but none of that sort of hung over into to that sort of. Job. And again, part of part of his 
um, strength as, as a coach or a director rugby, whatever you call it, was he was able to um, sever those sort of friendship ties when necessary, certainly during the week in training. Um, you knew who was boss, you knew who was a coach, you knew who was a player. Um, and he, he found that he found that very well. I don't know if he found it easy, but it certainly looked easy, and that was part of his um, his development as a coach, the, the ability to step away and, and actually have a bit more of a, um, a separate uh, mind about it, rather than being an ex player who's now a current coach. I don't know if that makes sense, but um, yeah, the relationship. Yeah, we, we uh, I think like I say we've we got on pretty well. We had our moments, and uh, as as most most sort of uh, bosses and employees do, but. Um, yeah, he, he, he coached the game the way I like to play it and I think I played the game the way he liked it done as well. So, yeah, it worked. we worked our way through some of the rough patches. Absolutely. So if you don't mind, I just want to quick, I want to kind of more touch on the 2007 Rugby World Cup campaign, um, especially building up to the final against South Africa in 2007. Um, a very big day for you for every other player in that squad Brian Ashton at the time was the coach you'd lost to South Africa early on in earlier on in the tournament in the group stage yeah. as well um you're, you're having to go around and look at people wearing berets all the time and things like that being in France as well um wearing onions yeah. yeah onions exactly yeah we've all done the French tours if you've if you've been at a local <laughs> rugby club down the years um I suppose what was as a coach, you'd have been coached by many different people, but I kind of wanted to understand the message that Brian Ashton gave before that final, if you can remember, if you can touch on it. Um, it, it it's, I, mean, I think everyone thinks that when, when you're in a final, there's loads of stuff to say. Loads of people want to be Churchill and stand up and you know, do this. You know, um, we're going to do this, we'll do that. But, uh, but actually, there's not a lot of talk. It wasn't a lot of talk. There's a bit of nervous chatter going on. I think there's, there's, and that's... That's the same in any rugby change room before a game. You've got people who, uh, before a game, like to prepare by just going into their own sort of little corner and keeping themselves themselves. You've got other guys who want to shout and scream and bang on the walls and stuff like that. And then you've got the people in between. So the, leading up to the World Cup final, a little bit different because I started on the bench. Um, but there wasn't that sort of massive uh, loads of chat. Was, everyone knew it was a World Cup final. Everyone knew the gravity of the situation. Um yeah, you know, different different for us because we probably shouldn't have been there. We, we were a terrible team back in those days. We were, um, we, should, you know, we were beaten thirty six nil by the same team we were playing that day. So I don't think anyone really went in there expecting us to be um, dominant and win. Um, so actually, in some ways, being the underdog, the, the, the pressure was off us. Um, the pressure was completely on South Africa because they've been the best team in the world for the best part of four years. But from, the, from the day they got knocked out of the two thousand three World Cup, um, they were preparing for for Paris two thousand seven. And they went into that, into that game as heavy favourites, been um, rugby championship uh, winners, whatever it was called back then. The uh, Southern Hemisphere tour. They've been, they've been Tri Nations. It would have been back then. I would have thought. Yeah, Tri Nations. That's right. Yeah, um, and they, they were the best team in the world, and rated number one. So that all the pressure was on them. Uh, and for us, we were a team that barely scraped by America in the first game, and. Barely scraped by Tonga and Samoa in the yeah. third and fourth game. I can, I can, so very, even though I was young, I can remember there being much kind of. It's a final. We'll see how we do, yeah. kind of thing. It yeah, wasn't. Well, yeah. There was all, there was yeah. a, there was much understanding, I think, amongst people that were older than me. I myself at the time probably thought, "Wow, we've got a great team," um, and then was frankly brought down back to earth. I think set. I want to. I want to say maybe October, November of that year, when yeah. or the year after when we played uh, South Africa at Twickenham and lost forty two six. Yeah, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know if you're involved in that one, but um, no, I wasn't. Either, uh, yeah. But I went to what that was my first game at Twickenham, and we got absolutely trounced by South Africa. Um, but the but the point yeah. the point really of the, the side of it was we'd done well to get to the final, and it was yeah. all we could have asked as at the time as well. We, I think I think we beat you beat you beat France on your way there as well, didn't you? Yeah. In, in the in yeah, the we, end tournament, quarter final we beat Australia in Marseille, um, which was a fantastic occasion. It's always great to beat Australians at anything. Um, but they, they spent a the whole week talking themselves up. And you know, we, we actually went into that game quite confident because they, they'd been in, the, in a pool with, I think, Canada and a couple other minnows. So they'd not had, they, they'd won their pool easily. They, didn't ha they hadn't had a proper game yet, as it were. No, not at all. I think they'd won everything by about 30 points. Um, and yeah, they, they were a good team. They had some good players, don't get me wrong. But they'd not been tested. They'd not been under pressure at all. And, and we, we sort of had to scrap our way through through everything in that, in that uh, pool stage. So we were pretty confident. We, we'd seen a few of their weaknesses and we thought, well, we can exploit this. 
in the first sort of 15 minutes of the game, things had gone perfectly. We, we put them on, under pressure where we said we're going to put them under pressure, and they've not reacted. They didn't fold, but they were certainly on the back foot and were were very very flustered. So, yeah, that, that was a great great uh, great game, a great evening actually, because we, we we bowled out of the stadium and um, uh, into a bar in Marseille just by the old port, which is a beautiful part of the town. I don't know if you've ever been, um, and then we watched the the French beat the New Zealanders in the other in the other quarter final, which was again one of the one of the great games of all time. Um, so we, yeah, we had a cracking day with that semi final. Then we, we realised we had to play the French, so we we're all sort of che- cheering and singing and dancing with the locals. And suddenly, it sort of slowly dawned on everyone that we were going to be against each other next week. And we sort of like, see you later. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah pretty much. Um, and then yeah, we, we, we beat the French in the semi final in, in, in Paris, which was which, which is a massive occasion. And uh, again, a game we were quietly confident about I think, because we matched up well with the French. We, Obviously, slightly different to playing Australia and New Zealand and South Africa. We don't play them that often, we do now, but back then we didn't play them that often. So, well, the French we play them every year, and then we play the club rugby as well. So, you had more of an we, understanding. We we yeah, we thought we had the measure of the French, and you know, although it was a big, a big occasion, a big high pressure uh, environment, we, we, had, we had people like Johnny Wilkins who had been there and done that, and, um, uh, and we won that game, which was, but you know, we, we shouldn't even have been there. We, from, the, from the sort of Quarterfinal onwards, we were just uh, yeah happy to be here. We're, we're you know we'll, we'll, we'll see what we go and we'll, we'll go out and give it a crack and see what happens. And you know, if we win, we win. If we don't, then no one's expecting us to win. So no, like I said before, no no pressure on us at all. Really, I can't imagine then. Although downhearted after the final whistle in the final, you you probably as a group of players reflected on the fact that you'd come a long way from that first yeah. defeat to South Africa, the thirty six nil defeat that you're talking about. Definitely, yeah. Well, it was funny. You, you, you never want to lose. Um, certainly, a final. You get to a final or a semi final, you don't want to lose. Of course, you don't. But like, like I said, the fact that we weren't really supposed to be there, disappointed for about 45 minutes afterwards. I sort of sat in the changing room, having to watch them pick their medals and the cup up and you know, give them a sort of like a polite clap there while they get inside, get in the changing room. And you sort of sat there for half an hour, 40 odd minutes, and you're like, you know what, just, you just lost the World Cup final. And then slowly, people sort of start picking themselves up and you have, a, you have a cold beer or something while you have a, have a bath and you realise, yeah, well, I just played the World Cup final and you know, we, we probably shouldn't have been there. We you know, look, look back four or five weeks and we were out of the tournament. In fact, after the South African game in, in the pool stages, uh, guys were phoning home and speaking to their kids and the kids were like, oh, when are you coming home? Like, oh, I'll be home in a couple of weeks. We're not going to get out of the pool. So some guys were generally like that. It was, it was very much that sort, of, that sort of feeling across the squad in, in some ways. And, so when you look back from from the losing the World Cup final to looking back four weeks where you, you, you were not even expected to be there, um, it was it was yeah, it was easy. It was a way, it was a good way to get over the dis- disappointment. Um, and yeah, I mean, we, we, had a, we had a good night out that night as well. We had a, we had a good a bit of a blowout in, in Paris. Um, and I think um, you know, at the time it was a really rough time. We were under a lot of pressure from the media and press, particularly after that South African pool stage game. So actually, we sort of got a bit more of a bunker siege mentality about us. So we actually we we came we came quite a close squad, uh, and yeah, we we had a good end to the tour, and we sort of went our separate ways and um, uh, went back home uh, on, the, on the sort of Monday, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. It, it was relatively easy to get over. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine it was quite. I can imagine. I don't know if there was much of actually a similar feeling amongst this England squad that got to the World Cup final against Africa that's just gone as well because. We certainly didn't. We 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 did play well in parts. Don't get me wrong. We played a fantastic. Uh, it was our semi final, wasn't it, against New Zealand? We played yeah. a fantastic semi final, and that was almost our final in many ways. That was the yeah. game where we really turned things on. But equally, we didn't turn up in other stages. Yeah, I think the difference with this squad was that they, they before the tournament they were they were one of the favourites, and they, they would have been speaking about that as well. They would have. I think they must have been speaking to press about it as well. That their goal was to win the World Cup. Um, you know, we we. We didn't say that anywhere. We we lost to Argentina at Twickenham in 2006 in the autumn. We shipped 40 odd points to the All Blacks that same autumn international. We had a pretty pretty different Six Nations leading up to the um, World Cup in 2007. Whereas this current crop, they've they've had sort of grand slams in the last three or four years. Uh, they, they've played very very well. They've, they've played one of the best games in the have ever played against the, the Irish in Dublin uh, the year before in the Six Nations. So this is a really confident, settled squad, um, and I think. If, Ours was not. Ours was very much a squad that was uh, cobbled together very late on. But even, even with a new coach, Brian Ashton didn't wasn't in position until the Six Nations, so he only had six months as a head coach. We had guys who, who were retiring sort of in 2006. So we, we went to the 2007 World Cup as a very dis- sort of disjointed squad, very 
Ragabond or Ragabond sort of group, really. Whereas, you say, this, these guys have been with Eddie Jones for four years. So I think that their their explanation, yes, you, you, you beat New Zealand people, I think, naturally, whether they, whether you um, believe it or not, they expect you to win the next game. I think they probably went to the final as favourites. Uh, and then to be comprehensively outplayed, not just lose, but be comprehensively outplayed by the South Africans and probably outcoached as well. I think that's quite a bit of pill to swallow. Um, and again, without sort of comparing too much, I think when we were there, we were just, again, happy to be there and you know, we, 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 we didn't fancy this. We'll, we'll, we'll give it our best, but really, um, we've got nothing to lose, whereas these guys had a, a lot on that, I think. So I, I, I do think I do think there's a bit of, and there's been a bit of a hangover, I think, with some of the international players. They've come, I know the season's been a bit sort of disjointed anyway. They've come back and not been that great for their club. So I think it, it is, it's a difficult, mentally, it's a difficult block to get over, I think. Absolutely. So um, much more difficult than 2007. Absolutely. Uh, George, I want to thank you for your time so far. Just to finish off, I wondered if you m- wouldn't mind doing a kind of quick fire five questions with myself. Yeah, sure, yeah. Um, so first of all, without without much thinking, the best player you played with? Uh, Jordan Murphy. Absolutely. Best player you played against? Do you want to explain them? Oh, you can. You can. Go for it. I mean, I think the question is difficult. If you're talking about the best player in terms of skill and everything, that's... Uh, by far away, Jordan Murphy, he, he just um, a guy who could perform unbelievable feats on the field with ball in hand and with ball on foot. Probably the best player, all-round player, would be Mike Johnson, but um, you know, I'll take either of them, thanks. Best player you played against? Um, Richard McCaw. And, and fortunately or unfortunately, I only played against him once uh, in 2006 when New Zealand battered us at Twickenham. But it, I think he's the best player there's ever been um, in, in the history of the game. And just... No weaknesses to his game. His attack, defence, whatever you like. He plays 147 Test matches for New Zealand. Gets one yellow card in that time. Uh, I think he. I think I'm right in saying he played 146 games in yeah. 80 minutes. He only ever. I think he started on the bench once. Yeah, no, like uh, maybe a yellow card, but he got a yellow card. It's the only game he didn't play 80 minutes in the Test matches. Yeah. Which is incredible. Uh, amazing. Uh, that's actually quite um, an interesting thing, considering you've gone for two players that are more back row and you're a hooker yeah yeah well I mean there's been some there's some, there's some great hookers but I, 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 I sort of fancy myself as a bit of a student of the game so I like, I like watching you like watching uh, the skillful scrum. players nowadays as well yeah, I, like watching, I like watching scrums and line outs as much as the next front brother but also I, I love uh, I could watch, watch Jordan Murphy do his thing day after day which I did fortunately for 14 years I watched him in training very closely and uh, Richard McCaw I, I think probably if I'm honest uh, at my core I'd love to play in the back row but I'm um, foot too short and uh, two yards too slow but um, yeah I, I think some of the stuff he did on the field was just incredible and uh, for, for me it's, it's just the longevity and the toughness and the durability is just uh, astonishing um, Any words or any um, person that had the most impact on your career you'd say? Um, Francois Pina uh, the, quite an easy one that because again going back to my early days at Saracens I was first year there I was very much a second team player and uh, he came in halfway through, actually. He came in around sort of uh, Christmas 96, so I'd been involved before he was there. Uh, and I wasn't really too sure how to be a professional. No one really told me, no one knew, as I said before. So I was a young lad living in London, getting paid a bit of money, playing a bit of rugby, and uh, I was enjoying it. I was having a great time with a couple of guys I lived with. Um, we got to the end of the season, and, and I think they were sort of thinking about letting me go. Um, I was out of contract. So, no, I wasn't out of contract. I think Andy Long was actually out of contract at Bath, and... He just played for England. I think um, Mark Evans was quite keen on getting him in and get rid of me uh, because he didn't see. I obviously wasn't doing much. I wasn't wasn't being professional, as as, as I said, and um, I was probably taking the thing not very seriously at all. Uh, out on the booze a bit, whatever. Um, and Francois, Francois sort of saw something in me, and then um, sort of sat me down and said, "You know, what, what are you doing with your life? Where are you going?" And, and sort of told me a few things here and there about being a professional. Taught me how to be a professional, really, I guess. And, and put a bit of faith in me as well and I ended up staying and again so that, that's more where, it, where it's all kicked off from. That must have been quite a, sur- a surreal moment at that point as well especially a man who lifted a World Cup with his country as well. Yeah. Absolutely well, like I say it, it, was, um, it was just great to talk to someone who knew Af- again South Africa being in isolation they, they've been professional since you know, the year dot they've been money involved there because they weren't allowed to play outside due to the apartheid uh, so Francois had grown up being professional he knew what it took to be a professional he, training wise diet wise uh, weights uh, lifestyle all that sort of stuff that no one had ever told me about no yeah we had 
you had no nutritionist knocking around saying, oh, you eat meat for protein and eat cheese, blah, blah. Uh, but he sort of sat down and mentally said, right, you know, you've got to turn to work every day as if it's a game day. You've got to train, you've got to be fitter than you are now, you've got to be fitter than everyone else, you've got to do this, do that, that. Um, actually just sort of sitting down and opening my eyes to how, how it was to be a professional was, you know, actually, was sort of starting my career, really. Absolutely. George, thank you so much for your time uh, with me today. Um, it will go up on YouTube at some point in the next couple of days. Uh, fantastic to talk to you. If you can share it with all your 15,000 followers, that would be fantastic as well. Uh, but fantastic to speak to you and uh, best of love. Better, well, best of, yeah, love to the family and all sorts, mate. Awesome. Cheers, now. Cheers, mate. Take care. See you later.